I thought I'd sort of start with the kind of broad idea that what we've been hearing today is that we've got a, a growing population, I mean 80% growth or something like that by 2060, and yet a uh, finite water supply. I mean, water fascinates me because it's kind of the one thing that Texas, you know, can't just build more of. I mean, we can to a, an extent, but uh, ultimately supplies are, are limited. And so with these two factors combined, I mean, uh, under the rubric water and the law, does this just sort of uh, automatically add up to, you know, increased litigation, um, sort of bonanza uh, for lawyers? And in what areas are we likely to see litigation? So I'll, I'll start. Maybe start at the end there with, with Mary. Well, if I was a law student, it might be the area of law that I'd go into, but um, long past that time. You know, I want to put a little different frame on what we've been hearing today. And I think Texas is at risk of actually scaring away economic development by failing to tell the positive story that's going on in this state. Yes, we have a lot of water problems. We have a lot of issues with drought, but we have a lot of things going for us. If you look at Texas Water Development Board figures over the 2008-2010 period, municipal use is flat or declining, despite adding a couple million people to the state. Agriculture's done an amazing job, and I think Commissioner Staples set out those facts in terms of conservation and increasing yields. With one exception, and we'll come back to that, I'm sure, in this panel, we're not driven by the Endangered Species Act, and we have in place Senate Bill 3 to try to keep us from being driven by the Endangered Species Act on our water management. But I think where we're in trouble, and this isn't gonna go unnoticed by business and industry, is our legal system on water. And I think we've had a few things happen that we can talk about on this panel over the last year or so that are gonna cause a great deal of uncertainty in our legal system for both groundwater and surface water. And I think that's the one thing that businesses can't deal with is uncertainty. I would agree with you, Mary. And um, I'm, I'm encouraged that there is a solution out there and that Texas is, is smart enough to figure out how to develop the future water that is needed. Um, and, and the example that I look at is Israel. If you look at the country of Israel, it is about the same size as that part of Texas that is within the Colorado Basin from above the Buchanan Dam down to about LaGrange. And there are 10 times the number of people that live in Israel than live in uh, that part of Texas. And the water supply for Israel comes out of the Golan Heights. And it's about 500,000 acre feet per year firm yield. And that's about the same firm yield of the lower Colorado River uh, system. And yet, Israel is absolutely self-sustaining. They can't go anywhere else to get water. They have to have uh, their own water to survive from a military standpoint. And so here, 10 times the people are able to use the same water resource, and they grow everything that they eat. They grow all of their fiber. Um, it can be done. It's just a matter of focus. It's about proper uh, valuing of water. Um, but just like Mary, the, the one thing that I worry about, and I'm sure we'll get into the day case here uh, before we are done, the one thing that I do worry about is the impediments that we're gonna see to water development as we really have to start sharing this resource within the state. Um, we're not going to solve our problem if we don't share the water. And when we start that sharing process, I think that triggers the legal process, which is gonna make it difficult. Well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, he talks about Israel. I had the opportunity to go to Israel last summer. And when I checked around, Joe, they didn't have any groundwater districts. So You're I, right. I think that's part of the issue. Israel has a nationwide, a national policy on water. And so, uh, and it's, it, it's a life, truly a life or death situation for them because they're truly surrounded by, by enemies. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we cannot borrow some of the great ideas that they do have there. 
And what we do have here is a system, I think, where we uh, talk about uh, doing something as important as Senate Bill 3 uh, that actually was a bill that, was, that stayed together over two legislative sessions. It was ready to go in 2005, Thanks to you. <laughs> uh, but for, for whatever reason, we could not pass it in 2005. So all those compromises and compromises and agreements that we made in 05 stayed intact to 2007, then we passed it. And so that's what we have, especially the environmental flows part of Senate Bill 3. And then we have a situation where we think we know what the rules are. Everybody had compromises and, and give and take in that legislation. And then co comes the TAP lawsuit, the lawsuit uh, regarding the whooping crane where the uh, plaintiffs in that lawsuit are seeking to undo a lot of things that we did in Senate Bill 3, uh, forcing the state to go back and uh, reevaluate the permits that are already in existence. So yes, lawsuits are uh, unfortunately, or the potential of a lawsuit, the litigation drives a lot of water policy here in the state to its detriment and makes it much, much more expensive. Billy, thoughts? Oh, I have lots, but, um, <laughs> you know, everybody wants to talk about Dave McDaniel case, and so I guess I'll just start there. But, um, you know, the world didn't come to an end when the Supreme Court issued its ruling on the Dave McDaniel case. Maybe we could just um, um, talk a little about what that was. Can you give a quick summary? Well, basically, you've had this almost 100-year argument over whether or not the landowner owned the groundwater or while it was a part of their land, or did they not own it until they'd actually captured it and had it in their physical possession? And it was those two sides arguing against each other, and the Supreme Court said, well, we decided that you owned oil and gas as part of your land, so you own the groundwater as well. I mean, to try to summar summarize a very complicated decision. But the bottom line is that with the Day McDaniel decision, there are a lot of people that thought that, oh wow, the world is basically turned upside down now. And that, that decision came this year. It came this year. That somehow or another private ownership of groundwater meant that you could no longer regulate it, you could no longer conserve it for the future and all these things. Which I found that to be fascinating that people thought that when I look around me every day and I see all these other regulations of private property that are out there. Clearly under Endangered Species Act, under water quality ordinances and laws and all of those things. So just because you own groundwater doesn't mean that you can't regulate it. And what I think it actually does is I think it finally sets the ground rules by which we can start developing groundwater in a responsible manner, just like the oil and gas companies went in and developed oil and gas fields under the regulation of the Railroad Commission. You can now start developing groundwater projects with more certainty than you could under the old environment where you didn't know really what your property right was. Because could you go in and get a big permit and then the groundwater district somehow or another tell the next person who came in line to get a permit, you can't have one? You know, we didn't know the answer to those questions. Now we know the answers to those questions. And I don't want to filibuster because now I feel like I'm Senator Hager. But um, no, love Senator Hager. He was house trained like the rest of us, right, Chairman? That's right. Um, <laughs> now I've completely forgot what my point was. <laughs> well, I to, no, to, to go further, to go further than that, you have groundwater is part of the land, and it can be regulated, just like anything else that's part of the land, like limestone, sand, gravel, any of those other things that you can mine or quarry or extract from the land. There's governmental entities that have that have regulated that for a very long time. So you can look at that case law to see how far you can go in regulating it. And then you have almost 100 years of railroad regulation of oil and gas that tells you to what extent you can regulate a migratory substance that's under the ground. So there is a roadmap there for regulation. They just have to follow it. So I'm curious about what is next in the, in the day case. And I've, I've warned my panelists that I don't want to relitigate it, but uh, I want to uh, sort of move forward and, and see what's kind of next. And just, you know, very, very quick summary. Um, the day case, you know, a couple farmers uh, challenged the Edwards Aquifer um, Authority, which said they could only um, um, get, what was it, 17 acre feet um, um, of water out of their land. And the uh, case went up um, uh, to the Texas Supreme Court, uh, which said, um, uh, you know, the authority had been saying that the historical use of 
of uh, these farmers meant that they could only get these 17 acre feet. The Texas Supreme Court um, um, had uh, said uh, that was, um, uh, they sent it back to um, a lower court to decide whether it was a, a sort of taking. Um, and now the case rests in the lower court. Mary? You know, from my perspective, um, I think Day might create a little certainty on one front. I think it creates a number of other uncertainties as it plays out in what amounts to regulatory taking by a groundwater district or the Edwards Aquifer Authority and what doesn't. If Day was a little bit of a grenade, the bomb out there is the Bragg case that's currently pending in the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals where uh, pecan farmers in the Edwards on one farm denied any water, on another farm limited to the amount that the Edwards Aquifer Authority by statute could give them. Um, if the Braggs win that case big on takings and are owed hundreds of thousands of dollars by the Edwards Aquifer Authority, I think that really undermines the ability of the EAA to function as the legislature intended. It's going to affect what other groundwater districts can do. And I think if the EAA is undermined, San Antonio's back to the drawing board because that was the solution for the city of San Antonio. So the case that I would watch is Bragg. Right. You know, Mary, that, that not only was a solution, it still is the solution. The, the regulatory system that Billy is advocating where uh, you, you can own something but it still is regulated works, works extremely well in the Edwards Aquifer region, th that authority, because they're a water utility like San Antonio water system. They know, uh, we know how much permit we have. We know how much we can uh, produce. Uh, we know when we can produce it. If we want more, we buy another permit from someone else, from a farmer or another right. in industry. Uh, there's a, a free market system there where you can buy a uh, permit out of water. There's limitations on the transportation of that water, like other groundwater districts do. But the uniqueness of that, it is that it's a regulatory system that is in place, that is centralized. In other words, it was legislation coming out of Austin that took a lot of the local politics out of it, so we don't have to deal a lot with protectionist type of legis regulation where the simplicity of we're, we don't want the water moving out from our small county over to the big city. It's not there anymore. So this is it. Although these two cases, Bragg and, and Day, McDaniel, come from that same uh, water district, Edwards Arthur Authority, it's interesting that they come from there, even though that's the best regulatory system I think the state has right now. Well, but I'll, I'm going to disagree a little bit with Mary about what the result ultimately may end up being, because the deal with the Bragg case is the reason why they were initially awarded compensation by the district court was by, based upon reasonable investment-backed expectations. And in most of the situations that we're dealing with, you're not dealing with a landowner that made significant, or utility, that made significant investments in thinking that they were going to be able to produce a certain amount of groundwater before a regulatory entity was in place with rules, which is the case with the Braggs. The situation that you've got that's going to, that with groundwater that has to be resolved is the situation with Dame McDaniel, which is discrimination. Discrimination is what got us to the Texas Supreme Court because the EAA system that the legislature set up for them is discriminatory. It awarded permits to historic users, and then once they reached the pumping cap, they were going to tell other landowners, you no longer have a right to the groundwater other than a domestic and livestock well. Discrimination is the issue that groundwater districts are going to have to struggle with going into the future. But again, there are Supreme Court precedents based upon the extent to which you can discriminate in oil and gas that were filed against the Railroad Commission. So there is a roadmap there to tell you how far you can go in treating one property owner differently from another property owner. The other big issue is going to be the DFCs. Oh, yeah. The DFCs are going to be the issue. Because when you have a different conservation goal for all practical purposes in one district versus another district, or in the case of the North Plains, they split one groundwater district. Half of it, farmers can pump more. The other half, they have to pump less. How do you, when they've got the same property right to that water, how do you justify that to the courts? That you're going to regulate them differently based upon a political boundary. That's going to be a big issue. 
Joe, did you want to chime in? By the way, sorry about all the parent weightlifting um, <laughs> upstairs. Just ignore that uh, weight behind the curtain. I just, um, I just hope I don't run into him after this. Thing I know. Or, or her. Um, I, I've got three points I'd, I'd like to make, in, and I'm going to try to take us up a little bit higher and out of the out of the details, primarily because I don't know the details. <laughs> Save us all. Take us up. <laughs> Not being an attorney, but I'll, I'll share with you a, a, an experience that I've had in the last month um, that relates to my own little town of, of Bastrop. We, we need to develop additional underground water supplies. The supplies that we have today are failing alluvial wells that are along the Colorado River. And so I've been to the underground water district that uh, regulates the, the uh, aquifers within our area. And what I have found there is not dissimilar to what I've seen in other parts of the state as well. As a reaction to the day case, the district is now afraid to regulate because they're afraid of the lawsuits that they could face. Um, they they probably are going to take the position that anyone that comes and applies for uh, a permit to develop and or move water, they will issue it. And then they'll let the results sort itself out. And I've seen more than one district take that, that same position. And Billy, the, the difference, I think, in, in regulation that we see in underground water from other uh, attributes of, of land, like limestone or gravel or, or whatever, uh, is that like oil and gas, the water flows in between adjacent properties. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and, and, and it took decades upon decades to finally successfully regulate the oil and gas industry. Mm -hmm. um, Therefore, I, I believe that what we're finally going to see, and this is from 30,000 feet, I think what we're going to finally see is uh, based on this Supreme Court ruling and perhaps some other rulings that will happen afterwards, is the state of Texas is going to have to once again get involved in underground water regulation. Um, the state determined at one point that it would allow all of the underground water districts to be developed for local control. Um, I, I see it ultimately coming back to the state for um, regulations similar to, to oil and gas, which might not be a bad thing in, in my opinion because that is the way that surface water is regulated within the state. But the scary thing is, um, if it takes decades to do that, we all have to realize that underground water is the linchpin to the successful future water supplies in the state of Texas. We're not going to build a whole bunch of, of new reservoirs. That ain't going to happen. We're going to build pipelines from the east moving water to the west, and we're going to develop underground water that can augment that surface water during drought periods. That's going to be the solution. So, and now you layer on top of that um, critical droughts in the future, having temperatures that are three and four degrees greater than the critical drought that we had in the 50s. And there, in my mind, and I'm 67 years old, there's a sense of urgency there that. Um, may be hard to meet given what we're about to go through with this underground water regulation. I mean, I think we've punted our groundwater policy to the courts for the next 10 or 15 years if we don't get a little better handle. And I couldn't agree with Joe Moore that most districts that are out there are looking at the day case and looking what's on the books and the way they, the only safe path they see towards issuing permits is issue them and then try to manage on water levels. And if the water levels start to go down below some desired level, they're going to cut everybody back equally across the board. You know, from a conservation standpoint, that might not bother me too much. 
if the water level target is right, but from an investment standpoint, that's a hard way to invest if you're going to develop a project. And, and that's exactly right. You know, we have uh, millions and millions of dollars invested in groundwater projects, one particularly from Gonzales County coming to, to San Antonio. We have already spent $50 million on that project, not a drop of water yet, another 50 or so million to be spent on it. Should be online by next year. But when it comes to those lawsuits, that uh, they're going to have to be filed in the rural county. Mm -hmm. And what is that rural county judge going to do? He's going to rule in favor of his constituents that locally elect him. And that's just what, how they do it. And the regulation comes from the locally elected commissioners of that groundwater district. And so when you're talking about these projects, you need that certainty because if you ask for a permit to move that water from rural Texas to, to San Antonio, for example, it's a five-year permit. The bonds that we floated to pay for that are 30-year bonds. Uh, and so we need some certainty. That certainty is not there right now. And um, it, it just handcuffs you to an extent. This project that I was talking about, initially it was a 56,000 acre feet project. Because of regulation, because of just the inability to m m meet those uh, unscientific requirements that they put on you, that project is roughly a 17,000 acre feet project now and cost even more than before. Uh, I, spoke at the on, Billy, I, spoke, I spoke at the groundwater, well, I, I'm agreeing and disagreeing with all of y'all in part today. Um, I spoke at the groundwater summit, I guess about a month ago now that they put on, and my message to them is that Texas Farm Bureau supports them. Our policy, our members, I've got lots of Farm Bureau members that sit on groundwater conservation district boards. I've got other members who probably want to sue a groundwater conservation district. Um, but my message to them was, guys, it's time to grow up. If you are going to be the preferred method of groundwater management in the state of Texas, then you need to look at this Dave McDaniel decision. You need to sit down and figure out what it means because the law is there to tell you what it means. And you need to, to get to the business of managing groundwater. They still have their DFCs. They still have the police power given to them by the Texas legislature to regulate groundwater, and they have 100 years of case law on regulation of private property rights to tell them what they can and can't do. And when it comes to developing groundwater projects, and even, Joe, I mean, I, I hear not just what Bastrop says, but what rural water corporations were telling us last session when we were working on Senate Bill 332 to recognize private property rights in groundwater, and they were so worried that they could no longer go out, buy a 10-acre track, and put a well in, and just pump all the water that they wanted. Because the landowners around that well site, my God, were gonna have private property rights. If we can develop the oil and gas industry we did in the state of Texas, with oil and gas companies going leasing and buying mineral rights from landowners, and putting in the infrastructure that they have put in, we can do it with groundwater too. You can do it. San Antonio has the wherewithal to go into Gonzales County and lease and buy groundwater rights over a large enough area that that district basically has to give you a permit because you got the property right to drill a well and to produce a reasonable amount of water in compliance with their DFC. So, um, by the way, I'm impressed that it took us about three minutes to get into the day case. Um, but uh, uh, one, one other thing I wanted to talk about before um, uh, maybe moving on from that is, is uh, what water marketers, you know, what does the day case mean for uh, uh, sort of water marketers in the state? What's the future of, future of that? You know, basically folks that are gonna pump, um, wanna pump a large amount of water and sell it, uh, sell it elsewhere. Well, uh, let me answer that this way. Because San Antonio had so many problems addressing groundwater districts and their rules and their changing rules, uh, each time a new election happened, a new wave, a different wave of groundwater districts would get elected and have their own thoughts on how to regulate this groundwater. We said, uh, we need groundwater, we need further supplies, but we're not going to play that game anymore. We essentially put it back on, out on the water marketer, as, as you said, and we asked them, bring us a proposal to the gates of Bear County you do all the permitting, you do all the political homework back home, you lay the pipeline, you get the financing, we'll pay for that water at, at, at a turnkey project at our gate. We'll pay for that water at gate. We have four proposals that have come in. We will probably make a decision the early part of next year as to which of those four proposals 
we're going to negotiate with. And so uh, it's more expensive that way because nobody can build pipelines and lay pipe downs so like we can. Uh, because we have the easement authority, the, uh, the uh, condemnation authority if we have to do that. But we found out it's just politically very difficult for somebody in rural Texas to say, I'm going to allow the leasing of this groundwater for you to take it to that municipal, that big city. It's a big city, rural kind of issue. And so if, if, if that project is developed by that marketer locally, then we can buy that water, we can lease that water. So that's how we've addressed it. Mary, you're shaking your head. Well, I don't disagree with that. I just think there's a separate point. I mean, I think we talk about the state as looking at it in one way on groundwater. It's not. You know, if you're in Menard County, you're out there. No, you don't have enough water to market to anybody. Leave them alone. Let them run their little groundwater district and protect the San Saba River with their management plan. But we do have areas where there's a lot of marketing pressure. And still in those areas, we have districts that are running on fumes and are depending on the goodwill of some leaders in the community to just serve on their board and scrape together enough to pay a director. They don't have very much science. I mean, if we're going to say groundwater districts are the preferred method, I think we have to support them both with money, with science, and defense against litigation that is going to come their way under the current uncertainties. I mean, I don't disagree that you can say a couple of things about they are certain, but I remember Billy's presentation at the Groundwater District saying, here's what they said, and oh, by the way, here's five other questions that it didn't answer. And I, I just think those are, those are out there, mm -hmm. and they're going to get litigated. You know, mm -hmm. but despite all this, I think it really takes someone and some entities to just flat out work together. And there was a proposal, you know, interbasin transfers are illegal in the state of Texas. But there was a proposal to transport some lower Colorado River water towards San Antonio that was going to create 330,000 acre feet of new water. What a deal. What a deal. <laughs> um, and surprisingly, one of those four proposals I'm talking about is from his hometown. And I just found out he needs groundwater. And so, a new proposal can develop out of that. But Joe Beale and I worked on that issue 15 years ago, 10 years ago. Uh, but it took someone to just start advocating those issues to get away from that feeling of your water, our water, rural, urban. Uh, there's enough water here in the state of Texas to meet everybody's uh, needs. There's not a water shortage in the state of Texas. Is a political shortage. There's enough engineering, there's enough money, there's enough need to develop water sources here in Texas. We just don't have the political climate in which to do it. The chairman is, is absolutely right. Um, even the studies that were done after the last critical drought when the Water Development Board was created um, found that there is enough water resource within the state of Texas to meet Texas's future needs. That's the reason on the Sabine River uh, that uh, Toledo Bend got built. There's two million acre feet of firm yield in Toledo Bend Reservoir. Today there are 30,000 acre feet being used. Think about that. Now one million belongs to the state of Texas, one million belongs to the state of Louisiana, but there's a tremendous amount of water in East Texas that could move to the, to the west. The engineers came up with the plan. It was a flawed plan. It didn't consider the environment. And so it crashed and burned. But now we're smarter, and we do consider the environment. We could do a better job, but we do, and there's a process in place. And so you're, you're going to see that water be ultimately developed. And Robert's absolutely right. It is a, a, the political process is what gets to be important. It took a law that he carried and got passed. It took a law to allow LCRA to move water to San Antonio. And we're not dissimilar to every other place within the state of Texas. And it took a couple of sessions to, to do it. Um, but the, the engineering part, and I think even the environmental part, is pretty easy. 
it's the political part that's going to be difficult. Well, one thing I, I heard you say earlier that kind of caught my eyes, you know, and, and Billy, you, you alluded a little bit to this too. We've, we've had uh, a century or a little bit more of, of oil and gas law. And how far behind, sort of broadly speaking, is water law? I mean, these are both sort of resources uh, in the ground, Billy. Well, in the Day McDaniel case, the Supreme Court said that they based their opinion that landowners own the groundwater based upon the rulings that they had made with regards to that the landowners own oil and gas. So what follows from that is that, generally speaking, the decisions that they've made since then with regards to a mineral owner's rights to drill a well and produce oil and gas, those same precedents apply to groundwater. And, and if you so read we build the build on oil and gas law. So you yeah, you you've got a roadmap that's already been laid for you with oil and gas law with regards to the extent to which you can discriminate between what one landowner can produce and what another landowner can produce, which is what a lot of those cases were. Uh, and all of those cases were in all the briefs that all the attorneys wrote in the Day McDaniel case. Either attorneys were telling the court that the oil and gas cases shouldn't apply or that the oil and gas cases should apply. And the should apply side won. So <laughs> that should tell you what's going to happen in the future if you've got a lawsuit dealing with a takings claim with regards to groundwater. Now the, the difference between groundwater and oil and gas is that your right is to produce it and put it, is to produce it and use it without wasting it, okay? There is no difference in what a landowner can produce without waste of oil and gas between this landowner and this landowner. That's not the case with groundwater. A corn farmer can use a lot more water than a rancher. So does the rancher have a right to go in and say, I want two acre foot per acre just like the corn farmer? No, because that's not what your property right is. Because you cannot pump two acre foot per acre and use that without wasting it. You cannot, so it's not discrimination to tell the corn farmer that they can pump two acre foot per acre because they can use that without wasting it and tell the rancher, sorry, we're just going to give you what you can use for your livestock. Mary, did you want to chime in there? I think you told us not to relitigate the day case. Oh, okay. One big How difference. That might work on, on take, when it comes to taking compensation. One big difference uh, that I know Billy appreciates is when you talk about regulation, whether it's that rancher or that uh, corn, uh, the, the corn grower, or even the city using that water, is that withdrawal from that groundwater district is regulated by the groundwater district or maybe even TCEQ. If it's for oil and gas, it's by the Railroad Commission. And we all know the Railroad Commission exists for the oil and gas industry. So they can do it. We can't. Um, on that note, if there are, are there any questions?